pop quiz. It's 2 a.m. and you wake up to a soft, persistent knocking at your front door. You roll out of bed, rub your eyes, and make your way down to the door. Glancing out the side window to see who it is that's knocking at 2 a.m., you see two kids, probably between 10 and 14 years old, wearing hoodies that are slightly ill-fitting and a little bit dingy, whose heads are face down to the ground so you can't really see their faces. Are they A, dedicated Girl Scouts trying to sell those last 50 boxes of Girl Scout cookies? B, really short missionaries there to tell you that the end of the world is nigh? Or C, black-eyed kids? Okay, that was kind of a trick question because I wouldn't open my door for any of them. But black eyed kids have been setting the internet on fire for almost 25 years. And today we have five more chilling encounters with black eyed kids. And make sure you stick around to the end where we answer the question what happens if you let them in? The encounter that kicked off the modern era of black eyed kids sightings and has had the internet buzzing for decades happened in 1996 in Abilene, Texas. Brian Bethel, a reporter for the Abilene Reporter News, is sitting in his car outside the mall about 9 30, 10 o'clock at night, using the light from the nearby theater marquee to write a check to his cable company that he plans to pop in the overnight drop box. Lost in his task, Brian is startled by a knock on his driver's side window. He looks up to see two boys somewhere between the ages of 10 and 14. And he notices that one of them has dark hair with olive skin, while the other one has more pale red hair with lighter skin. But beyond that, the rest of them seems pretty typical. Typical young boy build, young boy clothes, young boy haircuts, or lack thereof. He notices nothing unusual and assumes that the boys are going to ask him for money or something. But as soon as he starts moving his arm to roll down the window, he notices a slight change of perception that sets off warning sirens in his head. But too late. So Brian rolls down his window just a little bit. Still not sure why his fight or flight has kicked in, but glad his car is still running, just in case. What do you want? He asks, and the dark-haired boy responds, We want to see the movie, but we left our money at home. Can you help us out and give us a ride home so we can get it? Brian feels the irrational fear growing, and he looks at the theater marquee, and then down at the clock on his dashboard. The last showing of Mortal Kombat started almost an hour ago. If he gives these kids a ride anywhere, the movie will pretty much be over by the time they get back. And Brian is hesitant. The odd smile on the speaker's face making him nervous. And his lack of response draws a round of assurances from the boys. It won't take long. We're just little kids. It's not like we have a gun or anything. And Brian notices that his hand is drifting toward the door handle. He jerks it away and looks at the boys out the window. And in that brief moment that he breaks eye contact with the dark-haired boy, something changes. And his mind explodes in a hurricane of all-consuming terror. Brian looks back at the boys and is horrified to see them staring back at him with solid jet black eyes. Giant, soul-consuming black holes reflecting the light from the theater marquee. He has now moved to level 10 panic mode, but tries to appear calm. He ekes out a very weak, sorry guys, I gotta go, puts his car in reverse and starts rolling up his window. The boys can see Brian's fear, and the boy in the back has a look of confusion. But the spokesperson starts banging on the window sharply as it's rolling up and with venom tinged words says, We can't come in until you tell us it's okay. Just let us in and we'll be gone before you know it. But the sight of those infinitely black eyes is enough to get Brian into action. He backs out of the parking spot and rushes out of the lot in a blind panic. Once back on the road, he steals a quick look in his rear view mirror before he stomps on the gas. The boys are gone. And now, 
After years of reflection, Brian still doesn't know what happened to him that night. But he says there is one thing that he does know. A gut feeling that rises to the level of almost certainty. If he had given them a ride, he wouldn't be here to tell the story today. One of the earliest accounts of an encounter with a black-eyed kid occurred in the 1950s in Virginia. It is not the earliest account of a black-eyed being, but it is the oldest one that I have found so far that includes all of the behaviors that we think of as a modern-day textbook black-eyed kid encounter. The story was told to author David Weatherly by a man whose hardworking family of farmers and fishermen had lived in rural Virginia for generations, and whose clan lore included this story about one of their kin, Harold. A 16-year-old boy at the time, Harold was walking home just before sunset. As he reaches the fence line that leads to his house, he comes across another boy, 10, 12 years old, leaning on the fence post. And Harold is a little perplexed. His family lives in a pretty small town, and he knows pretty much every face in it. But Harold is one of those rare individuals who can talk to and then make friends with just about anybody. So in true Harold fashion, he tries to strike up a conversation with the young man who continues to stare at the dirt road under his feet, totally unresponsive to anything Harold has to say. Being unaccustomed to the lack of conversational engagement, Harold starts to wonder if something's wrong. Hey, are you okay? And the boy responds, I want to go to your house. You're going to walk me up to your house. Why would a strange kid want to come to my house? Harold thinks to himself as a chill starts running through his body. And as Harold is trying to comprehend his body's primal fear response, the boy looks up at him, revealing solid black eyes. Harold's chills bloom into full-on fight or flight as he looks up the road toward his house. His legs feel locked in place, but his brain is calculating how long of a run it is from here to his front door. As if reading his mind, the boy blurts out, Now don't you walk away from me. You're going to walk me up to your house. The threatening vibe from the boy's statement is enough to kick Harold into gear. He turns and runs away faster than he has ever run in his life. Halfway up the road, he hears a scream behind him. A wild scream, guttural, like that of a bobcat. That sound pushes Harold to pick up his legs and run even faster, convinced that the boy is coming to get him. Once Harold hits the front door, he lurches inside and slams the door behind him. His mom, seeing him all out of breath, asks, What's wrong? So he tells his parents all about his strange running with the boy. Harold's father immediately grabs his shotgun and goes outside looking for the menacing boy, but he doesn't see a thing. So he comes back inside and Harold's parents say, okay, tell us again what happened. So Harold does, ending with the statement that the boy was as solid as you or me. So he knows it wasn't a ghost. Now, knowing that their boy is not one to make up tales, they believe his story. And Harold's father really doesn't know what to make of it. He's heard about some pretty strange things happening way out there in the country, but nothing as bizarre as this. And Harold's mother firmly believes that he has had an encounter with the devil himself. She has Harold change into his Sunday best, and she promptly takes him to church for a blessing. Later in life, Harold would tell his children that he always tried to forget the boy, but he could never get the image out of his head. Those eyes, they haunted me. This story comes from Reddit user In The Labyrinth. We're going to call him Jim. Jim's dad had recently passed, and his mom wasn't really taking it that well after having been married for 63 years loving years. She needed and appreciated Jim's support, and Jim was more than willing to go visit her and keep her company. But that night, it was getting late, so Jim said goodbye to his mom and headed out the door. His mom lives in the suburbs. Tiny lawns, plenty of neighbors, paved roads, and even though it's almost 11 p.m. when he leaves, the streets are still well lit by all the streetlights. 
These lights, however, only illuminate the road, and glancing across the street, the houses are cast in an eerie shadow. Even a safe, charming little neighborhood like his mom's can seem spooky and uninviting when cast in deep, late-night shadows. And Jim is spooked. Sliding into his car, he revs the engine, waves to his mom, who's standing in the doorway wrapped in a shawl. And Jim starts driving the car down the road and out of the neighborhood and decides to take the back way home since it's a shorter drive. In hindsight, he says this may not have been a good idea. Jim lives a decent distance away, way out in the country, in an old farmhouse that he grew up in. His dad had left it in his name when he and Jim's mom had moved to a smaller place. Growing up, Jim's father had always told him, don't go out at night and beware the devils. He was a strong believer in anything and everything paranormal, a very superstitious man, and Jim always had to resist the urge to laugh at his words. But he knew he meant well. Driving down these dark country roads, there are no street lights, and the paved road is cracked and full of potholes. The fields on either side of the road are empty, just blank stretches of overgrown grass and untended shrubbery. One might even see a deer or two in those fields, but not tonight. The moon offers little light as the sky rolls with dark, threatening clouds, ready to unleash a storm at any moment. And sure enough, a few moments later, Jim can hear the low grumble of thunder. No rain just yet, much to Jim's relief. He hates driving at night, and he hates driving in the rain. And he knows putting those two things together usually doesn't end well. Surrounded by the rolling thunder, Jim starts to feel anxious. He can't quite explain it. He just feels shaken up. But he just chalks it up to the the dark night, the impending rain, and reading way too many ghost stories and legends. Tonight is a perfect reflection of the mood of those stories, which he reads almost obsessively, slowing down a bit as he attempts to find a station that'll come in clearly. But nothing. Weird. There's a broadcasting tower right near the road that he's on. So it usually comes in perfectly, clear as day. But still, nothing. And the white noise and the static of the blank stations do nothing to appease Jim's anxiety. And he grips the steering wheel tightly as more thunder booms through the sky. More than a little annoyed, he shuts off the radio and glances down at his dashboard. He's almost out of gas. Ah, oh, crap, Jim says, and he starts searching for a gas station. As he scans the side of the road, he notices from the corner of his eye two figures walking along the shadows on the edge of the road. They're walking slowly. One turned around, walking backwards, with his or her thumb sticking out. And Jim feels compelled to pull over and offer them a ride. And he finds his hands turning the wheel slightly. But he pulls back, realizing how stupid it would be for him to let two random strangers into his car in the middle of the night on a backcountry road. So Jim speeds up and passes them, trying not to look at them. Though as he does, he feels oddly intrigued by them. But he quickly gets his focus back on the road ahead. It starts drizzling now, dropping his mood another level or two. And along with the rain, the thunder seems to be getting louder and closer as the storm moves in. Seconds after passing the hitchhikers, Jim gives in to his compulsion to look at the two figures as he steals a glance in his rearview mirror. It seems as if they're walking faster. But Jim figures that has to be his imagination. Because how would he be able to tell if they're walking faster with it being so dark and rainy? Looking back at the road in front of him, he almost misses a sign that alerts him to an upcoming gas station. A sigh of relief passes over his lips as he slows down, keeping his eyes peeled for the station ahead. The two figures long gone from his mind. And soon after, he pulls into the gas station slowly as the rain starts to pick up. 
The store is closed, but luckily they have 24-hour pump service. Jim shuts off his car and gets out, glancing over his shoulder. Still unable to shake that uneasy feeling that is still building inside of him. And as he stands under the light of the overhang, he's trying to figure out how to work the pump. His mind not being able to focus on the simple task. And the rain picks up heavier and louder as Jim, despite his shaking hands, is finally able to get the nozzle into his car. Jim has a horrible feeling that his shaking is not due to the cold, wet air. Suddenly, the overhead lights of the gas station start flickering, a couple of them going out altogether. It feels as if the temperature has dropped 20 degrees in the last few seconds. As Jim glances around, an even deeper sinking feeling emerging in his stomach. Turning around, back toward the road, he sees exactly what he expects to see. The color drains from his face, and he breathes in a quick, sharp breath. There, across the street, the two figures from the road stand there, facing him. They start crossing the street, slowly but surely, as Jim fumbles with the gas nozzle, willing it to pump faster. And Jim's whole body is shaking now as he looks back up. The hitchhikers are now at the entrance to the gas station. And Jim's breathing is quick and shallow as he blindly shoves the nozzle back into its holder, not able to tear his eyes away from the figures. And as they walk closer, he becomes more frantic, even though now that they're walking into the light, he can see that they're just teenagers. They look ragged, frigid, and soaked from the rain. And Jim straightens up a bit, still terrified. But another compulsive feeling, similar to the one he experienced in the car, is bubbling, and he feels obligated to talk to them. They are now standing at the next pump. As Jim slides in his car, fumbles for his keys, and drops them in the footwell. Leaning down, he swipes them up and sits back up. A cold shock hitting him as he suddenly comes face to face with one of the teens. The kid has one hand on his window, knocking forcefully with the other. And Jim rolls down the window slightly, but before he can open his mouth to speak, the teen speaks first, while the other one stands in the background, a bit of a grin on her pale face. Can you give us a ride into town? We miss the bus and don't have a ride. He speaks slowly, and something about his voice makes Jim shiver. Jim opens his mouth, but no sound comes out. Clearing his throat, Jim glances at the dashboard, and then at the keys in his hand. I'm, I, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm not going into town, he stutters, keeping his eyes down, avoiding the stare that he can feel coming through the window. And the teenager knocks louder, making Jim jump a little as he once again insists on a ride. And Jim says no to him once more and looks up, trying to seem intimidating. But a terrifying sight greets him. He looks the kid right in the eyes and gasps, his back pushing hard against the seat as he, in his panic, tries to move away. His eyes... His eyes are blacker than night, endless black, no discernible pupils, and no whites showing at all. Pure black, deep, brooding, and surprisingly intriguing. But Jim's fear gets the better of him, and he quickly turns the key, and the engine revs to life. And Jim, thanks God, it didn't stall. And the kid bangs on the window with a pale fist, screaming now for a ride. Jim puts the car in gear and goes screaming down the road. He had laughed at his father's superstitious warnings before, never taking them seriously. But now, as Jim heads down the road, he apologizes to his father again and again. After driving for a few more minutes, Jim pulls up into his driveway and up 
onto the lawn in front of his porch. At this point, he doesn't want to spend any more time outside than he already has. So he jumps from the car, leaving the car door open, runs inside, slams the door, and locks it. And he even goes so far as to put a chair in front of the door in case someone or something tries to get in. Sinking into the chair in front of the door, Jim shivers and cries uncontrollably, hiding his head in his hands as two dark figures stand there at the end of his driveway. The writer of this tale didn't give her name, so we'll call her Erin. Erin has read many accounts of these black-eyed kids, but doesn't think any of them come close to what happened to her when she let two of them in her house. Many people believe that if you let them in, they will kill you. But Aaron is here to tell us that's not necessarily true. This is her story. She's sitting in her bedroom at home one evening when she hears a knock at the door. It's not really that late, so she doesn't think twice about opening the door to whomever it is. When she opens it, there are two young boys standing there, looking at the floor. Yes, Aaron says, and the taller one asks, Can we come in? We're lost, and my brother needs to use the bathroom. Now, Aaron lives in an area where it's super easy to get lost. So she assumes they're telling the truth and are just looking down because they're shy. So Aaron lets them in, and the one who needs to use the bathroom heads right up the stairs like he knows exactly where he's going. So she shouts up after him, It's on the right! Now, maybe she should find this strange, but since most bathrooms are upstairs and the boy's pretty young, she doesn't really think anything of it. She points down the hall and says to the other one, Phone's over there. Thanks. He says and starts to walk in that direction and is suddenly overcome with dread. An awful feeling. A premonition that something bad is about to happen. She gets very nervous and a bit shaky, and she's not really sure why. And the boy stops at the phone and pauses. Everything okay? She asks. The boy turns to Aaron and looks up, allowing Aaron to see his eyes. A picture that she will never get out of her head. She is so scared, she can't even scream. And she turns to run down the hall, but the other kid is right there, standing at the end. Aaron becomes very dizzy, struggling just to remain standing as he walks closer to her, telling her, We've been sent to collect you. Aaron can't even look at his face, so she pushes her way past him and makes a mad dash for her front room, slamming the door behind her. She is in total shock. She can't even think straight. This is straight out of a horror movie. After standing against the door, holding it shut for what seems like an hour or so, Aaron finally musters up the courage to make a dash for the back door. She bolts to the door, unlocks it and runs as fast as she can through the backside of her garden and leaps over her fence, not looking back. Aaron's friend lives close by, so she runs to his house and tells him the whole story. But as she guessed, he's a little skeptical. Please come back with me, she pleads. But when they arrive and look through the house, they find no sign of the two boys or any evidence that anything happened. Aaron says ever since this happened to her, she has dreams that these kids are standing over her bed, their hands stretching out to her. She just hopes to God she never sees those black-eyed children again. The couple in this report live in a rural and secluded area of Vermont. Their names are not given in their account, so we will call them Rose and Paul. It's a snowy winter night and the view outside of Rose and Paul's windows looks like a Norman Rockwell painting. It's the middle of the night and Rose is awakened by a knocking at her front door. And knowing that the snow is making any kind of travel dangerous, her first thought is that there must have been an accident and somebody's coming to them for help. So she gets up, 
slips on her robe, goes over to her bedroom window, looks out, and can see that there are tracks coming up from the road into their driveway. But there's no car anywhere. The snow is still covering the road. Nobody's driven on it for at least a couple hours. And she can't quite see the front door from her bedroom window, but the motion sensor light is on and she can see that somebody is standing there. So she rushes to the bed, shakes Paul, and as she's telling him what's going on, the knocking at the front door starts again. And Paul throws back the covers, grabs his robe, slips it on as he and Rose make their way downstairs to the front door. When Paul opens the door, there are two children standing in the snow looking toward the ground, a boy and a girl who can't be more than eight years old. They're dressed strangely and have odd haircuts. The girl's hair is long and straight, and the boy's haircut is dated and almost looks like a bowl cut. They are not dressed for winter. And Rose's first thought is that they must be Mennonite children. But as far as she knows, there isn't a large Mennonite community anywhere near them. The children are very unnerving to Rose and Paul. They would not make eye contact. And Paul asks them, is everything okay? And they reply, can we come in? Paul looks to Rose with a, what do I do now look? And Rose asks the children, where are your parents? They'll be here soon, is all they said. Against their better judgment, Rose and Paul's parental instincts take over. They bring the children in out of the snowstorm and do what they can to warm them up with hot chocolate and make them comfortable until their parents arrive. And for a couple of kids that you might expect would be scared, cold, and freaked out from being lost in a snowstorm, they seem to be pretty comfortable sitting in a stranger's living room. And with their eyes still cast to the floor, they just keep repeating in a sing-songy tone. Our parents will be here soon. Our parents will be here soon. Our parents will be here soon. Rose starts to notice that of their four cats, three of them are hiding. Except Pigeon, who's with her in the kitchen as she's making more hot chocolate. Normally, the cats are very curious and friendly. And Rose and Paul have to make sure that they don't slip outside when somebody leaves. But this time, none of them even try to figure out who's there. All of the hair on Pigeon's neck is standing up and his tail is puffed out as he's staring in the living room. And when Rose bends down to pet him and see what's wrong, he hisses, growls, and backs up until he is hidden underneath the kitchen island. She has never seen him do that before. Rose makes her way back to the living room and says, more hot chocolate, doing her best to lighten the oppressive air in the room. Her announcement causes both children to look up, revealing their solid black eyes. Rose is horrified and it takes everything she's got not to drop the mugs and run away. The kids see Rose's reaction and both stand up and say, we need to use your bathroom. Rose's stare follows them as they both get up and go down the hall together to the bathroom. As soon as the children are out of sight, Rose turns to look at Paul, whose pale face and slack jaw tell Rose that he is just as shocked as she is. And they start to discuss what to do next. When Paul's nose starts bleeding, something that has never happened to him before, Rose runs to the kitchen to get Paul some tissues. When the power goes out, now, it's not unusual for the power to go out during a Vermont blizzard, but Rose cannot shake the feeling that it has something to do with those two terrifying kids. And as she's hurrying back to Paul, Rose is stopped dead in her tracks by the two kids who are done in the bathroom and are just standing together at the end of the hall, apparently unfazed by the sudden darkness. Rose is petrified with fear as the children just stand there, motionless. And after what feels like an eternity, the boy says, Our parents are here. And they walk to the door, open it up, and walk out, leaving the door wide open. 
Rose and Paul rush to the door to close it behind him and are taken aback by what they see in their driveway. The parents that the children had referred to are actually two men in black suits driving a black car. The men were very tall, at least six feet. And when Paul waved at them, they just stared back, got in the car with the children and drove off. Rose and Paul are more than relieved to have the black-eyed children out of their house. But the worst is yet to come. In the months that follow, Rose and Paul lose all four of their cats, three of them just disappearing and are presumably dead, and one of them having a hemorrhage and dying right there in the house. And both Rose and Paul continue to have nosebleeds. And not long after the encounter, Paul is diagnosed with an aggressive form of skin cancer. Rose does not go into detail, but says that she is in the worst state of health she's ever been in in her entire life. She is convinced that both her and her husband's ill health has everything to do with that snowy night that they allowed those black-eyed children into their home. If Black Eyed Kids are your jam and you need more, click here. Be careful out there, and we will see you again on The In Between.